And good evening to everybody. Welcome to another one of our series of webinars. Um, tonight, of course, as it says on the screen here, is a clinician's guide to CBD. And we're going to hear from uh, Charles um, Button Tender generally. I'll come to introduce uh, the Mark in a moment. Uh, but let me just uh, say a little bit about practicalities. We hope to finish around 6.45. If we overrun a bit, if there's a lot of questions, that's great, and we're happy to go on a little bit past that. Uh, but we'll have a sort of absolute cutoff at uh, seven, if that's okay. But we'll try and finish pretty well on time. Um, if we we'll let um, button tender guys uh, just talk to us for a while, but type your questions in if you have them uh, in the Q and A, not not the chat, because uh, it's easier to look. And then, but when we get to the end of the talk, we'll come off screen here. And we'll go and all of us try and answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A. So that's the general plan on the format. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is, well, that's me. Uh, this is, of course, organized um, with uh, Medical Cannabis Clinician Society, obviously with the support of uh, Button Tinder. <coughs> um, and our two speakers, as it goes there, is Mark, Mark Turner, one of the two founders of Button Tinder with his colleague, Charles Close, who's also founder of Button and Tender. So welcome to both of you. I'm just going to do um, a one minute um, recruitment drive. We always do this and it's uh, useful for those of you who aren't members of the society. We would strongly, obviously we would, but we would strongly recommend that you do join the society. If you have any clinical background at all, it doesn't have to be a doctor background. It can be pharmacy or nursing or therapy. Or, so, or, or someone with a clinical interest in, in cannabis, basically. We're, we're fairly relaxed about that. Um, we, we think it's a good society. We believe it is. We're now over, two, I think it's 260 members now, uh, which is a good number. Uh, we think we've got uh, in there most, if not all, but not all, but most of the prescribing clinicians uh, in the country as well. And we think we do produce some good uh, literature you can see some on there, recommendations and guidance uh, for a sort of guidelines of how to prescribe, when to prescribe, when not to prescribe. Um, as a practical guide about how to begin prescribing medicinal cannabis for the it leads you through all the necessary bureaucracy and the paperwork. We offer peer support. It's actually really good. Two Google groups, one for prescribing doctors um, and one for all other members. And if people ask a question in a Google group, we do get an answer, actually, I mean, uh, worldwide. Although it is a UK predominant, UK and Ireland predominant society, we're beginning to get quite, of course, this sort of society doesn't exist in other jurisdictions. We're beginning to get a lot of international members. We definitely, if we ask a question, we can get answers from the States, Canada, Uruguay, Denmark, Nigeria. Um, and people do reply quite quickly and efficiently for if doctors have a prescribing issue or other ones got just a question. So we put on events like this. We hope now we're beginning to be unlocked to go on the road again. We were just starting to go on the road with a sort of road show uh, when COVID hit us all. Uh, so we hope to get start that again in the new year. We produce these practical guides, as I say. We do training, um, alternate months with drug science, with a T21 program from drug science, which is excellent. And I'd, any um, relevant people and clinicians on the call, I would certainly recommend that you uh, join the T21 program and start um, prescribing on the T21 formally, which is very good. Uh, but every two months, I do a, a, a drug science and MCCS training session. Uh, you have to be a member of the society. Uh, we have licensed product information, which we try and keep up to date. Um, we're not, it's not a prescribing, it's not a clinic, so we don't have, um, you know, it's not clinic specific, but it's what all products that are available for doctors to prescribe in the UK and the expert prescribing guidelines, as I said. I've mentioned the Google support group 24-7. We have a, a good searchable evidence hub. So if you want to see what evidence there is for prescribing in anxiety or pain or whatever it is, you uh, members uh, can type in that and then you can get the downloadable papers. And we also try and keep that up to date. Um, <clears throat> and for those relevant for doctors particularly, it's been somewhat tricky to get um, uh, insurance. That's also incidentally insurance for clinics or dispenser or anything else. And we can do that through our colleagues at Towergate. Um, Richard Cupid at Target does a, a great job. And just for transparency, if you go through the 
that insurance for the doctors, I think we get something like 10% or 12% of the first year's money for the society because it's a non-profit uh, society and we do need money, I'll put it bluntly. Um, so membership to those who have any professional interest, physicians, GPs, nurses, etc. as I've said, anyone working across acute primary or community health care with an interest in cannabis, and that's the website uh, to join. So hopefully everyone on the call has joined already and I've just wasted two minutes, but if there's some who aren't, please feel free to join us. Um, so at that point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass to Mark and Charles to share their screen and we'll sit back and listen to them for 30, 40 minutes and then we'll get some questions at the end. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks very much again and off you go. Cheers, Mike. Thank you. I'll put myself on uh, off screen. There we go. <laughs> Okie dokie. So uh, my name's Mark. I'm here with my colleague Charles. We're from Budden Tender. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to run through the whole list there, but just a little bit about us. So we launched our first product in 2018. Uh, we were the first and only CBD oil to be recommended to UK CSC patients. We're also the first CBD company in the UK to publicly complete eight separate tests on our CBD oil for safety. And our CBD oil has actually won multiple awards being voted one of the best CBD oils in the UK. So what are we going to talk about today? We are going to cover the endocannabinoid tone. We're going to talk about different types of CBD oil. We're going to talk about the controlled cannabinoids in the UK. And then Charles is actually going to finish up talking about the certificate of analysis and why that's sort of crucial when you're thinking about buying a CBD supplement. So let's dive straight in. Endocannabinoid tone. So every living mammal has an endocannabinoid system. However, the tone of an individual's endocannabinoid system will vary from one person to the next. This means that cannabinoid dosage should be tailored to the individual to suit their endocannabinoid tone in conjunction with their medical condition. So a person's endocannabinoid tone is influenced by three main factors, receptors, cannabinoids, and enzymes. The receptors. So endocannabinoid tone can be influenced by the number of active cannabinoid receptors in the body. These receptors are essentially message receivers. Endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoid tone can be influenced by the ability of a person's body to produce human cannabinoids, endocannabinoids, when needed for intercell signaling. These human cannabinoids are essentially on-demand messages. And then lastly, the enzymes. So enzyme activity levels will determine the breakdown rate of your human, cannabinoid, human cannabinoids. These can essentially be uh, defined as post-messaging recycling. So the receptors, we have two types of different cannabinoid receptors in our body, CB1 and CB2. The CB1 receptors are predominantly located in the central nervous system with a high concentration in the brain. CB2 receptors are predominantly found in the immune system and the gastrointestinal system and the peripheral nervous system. So there's been speculation that there is also a CB3 receptor. Uh, hasn't officially been proven yet. Could it be the GPR55 receptor? We don't know. Time will tell. So that's, that covers us off on the two types of main receptors. Now we move on to the cannabinoids. So here we have human cannabinoids and plant cannabinoids. In blue, you can see the anandamide and 2-AG. Uh, 2-AG, they're binding to the CB2 receptor. And we also see uh, THC binding to the CB1 and uh, anandamide just above it with CBN on the right. The lower diagram shows that CBD can actually bind to a whole host of re uh, receptors, dopamine, serotonin, opioid. However, it doesn't actually bind with cannabinoid receptors. Uh, we'll, we'll cover a little bit more of this later. So these cannabinoids are essentially the message carriers. Enzymes. So once your human cannabinoid has bound with the receptor and it's passed on its message, it essentially needs to be broken down and recycled by the body. And this is the job of the enzymes. They uh, do this post-messaging recycling. So we'll see there that the FAAH uh, enzyme will break down anandamide and MAGL will break down the 2-AG cannabinoid. So now we're going to look at an example of the CB1 receptor and how this sort of this whole system works together. 
So you will see the presynaptic sending neuron, you will see the postsynaptic receiving neuron, and in yellow, you will see the neurotransmitters. What's interesting to note is this travels in a single direction only. And here we can see a human cannabinoid in blue that's been produced on demand to retrograde signal to travel back to the presynaptic neuron to bind with the receptor and pass on a message. Now, why is this important? And I'll give you an example. If I was to uh, talk to you and I'm the presynaptic sending neuron and you're the receiving neuron, let's just say that you can only listen and I can only talk. If I was to shout into your ear, you find it extremely uncomfortable and you may not be able to understand the message. The problem being, you cannot turn around and talk to me back and tell me to lower my voice. What you can do, and this is what the cannabinoids do, is you can write a note and you can pass it to me telling me to lower my voice so that you can understand me clearly and you can actually understand the message. So this is essentially what the cannabinoids do. They get that messaging system working correctly again. So why is your endocannabinoid tone so important? Well, the endocannabinoid system itself regulates numerous biological functions in your body. Now, if your endocannabinoid tone is low, you can potentially start to have health issues arising. So your endocannabinoid system will regulate pleasure, pain, sleep, appetite, mood, memory, uh, even your immune system, fertility, pre and postnatal development and cell health. Uh, and when it, we talk about the, the pre and postnatal development there, what's interesting to note is that uh, mother's milk produced by the breast actually does contain human cannabinoids to be passed on to the baby for the baby's endocannabinoid system. So what influences your endocannabinoid tone? Well, first off, genes are gonna play a huge part on that. Diet and exercise uh, heavily, heavily influence your endocannabinoid tone. Obviously, if you eat a good diet, it's gonna help improve your tone. Uh, and exercise has been shown, shown and proven to increase and improve your endocannabinoid tone. Chemicals, pollution, stress, viruses and deep diseases, these can all negatively impact your endocannabinoid tone. So I'm talking about the endocannabinoid tone and just to recap, so that is determined by the activity of your cannabinoids, your receptors and your enzymes. So the diagram you see in front of you is a simple 2D representation of uh, essentially the, the grade of tone. So you have the low tone in red, your regular, balanced, happy middle ground in blue and then uh, a high tone in green. This is 2D, but we have to imagine this is like a, a 3D uh, sphere where different cannabinoids uh, are going to essentially produce slightly different effects in relation to the endocannabinoid tone. But for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to uh, keep, keep it easy um, and stick to the 2D model. So what is a low endocannabinoid tone? So a low tone can actually be attributed to a multitude of factors. Human cannabinoid production might be very low. Your receptor activity might be low, along with poor enzyme activity. Basically, what's happening is your body isn't working correctly. Intercell messaging is not occurring correctly, and this can actually lead to cells turning toxic, which subsequently can lead on to uh, further health issues. So you're gonna be feeling a bit down at this point. You're gonna be low, slightly unhappy, and the health issues, well, there's possibly going to be many. So where do we wanna be? We want to be balanced, happy middle, endocannabinoid tone. You're gonna to be feeling good, content or happy. Health issues here at this point, they should be uh, small, minor, minimal. Here, we see that the tone is just right. Sufficient human cannabinoids are being produced when needed. The receptors are fully open, they're active, and the enzymes are working uh, efficiently. So as I said, you should, you should feel content, you should feel happy, you should feel healthy at this point. Now we move on to the naturally high endocannabinoid tone. So a good diet and exercise can naturally increase your endocannabinoid tone. After exercise, it has been observed that levels of the human cannabinoid anandamide are increased, which results in a feel good feeling. Long distance runners often report they experience a runner's high. It is now thought this is in part attributed to increased levels of anandamide, also known as the bliss molecule. So in this state, let's say after exercise, you're eating well, you're gonna be feeling great. You're gonna be happy. You should not be having any health issues. So can we push this endocannabinoid tone further beyond the natural limit? Yes, we can. We can get a higher endocannabinoid tone and this comes from plant cannabinoids. So this would be a result from direct binding plant cannabinoids, such as THC. 
how high you get and for how long will be determined by how much THC is present, the number of active receptors that you have and how active your enzymes are. So plant cannabinoids like THC, they actually take longer for the enzymes to break down as opposed to human cannabinoids. And this is essentially why a THC high lasts, lasts much longer than a, a naturally induced anandamide high. So with, with this THC high, you should uh, have an enhanced sensory experience, enhanced brain function, along with enhanced reality clarity. You should not be having any health issues here unless you abuse THC. And that uh, brings us on to what can you do if you have a low endocannabinoid tone? Well, in all honesty, the first thing you should do is try and boost your endocannabinoid tone naturally. Um, and you can do that, but to achieve it, you need to eat the perfect diet that's balanced in macro and micronutrients. You need to avoid all processed foods, trans fats, alcohol, or any food containing residual chemicals such as pesticides, and that's one to watch on the fruit. Make sure you wash your fruit. You must exercise daily in various disciplines and your sleep cycle must be perfect. Um, avoiding pollution in all its various forms and you must avoid getting stressed. Back to the sleep cycle, um, we're starting to see that 2-AG, the human cannabinoid, is uh, circadian and interrupted sleep can really disrupt your uh, 2-AG levels. So if you don't fancy exercising, continuously eating right and you enjoy your alcohol and you eat, enjoy eating trans fats and, and your foods with your residual chemicals in it, what else can you do to, to, to help boost your endocannabinoid tone? Well, you can actually supplement with plant cannabinoids. So what we see here, the diagram on the left, we see a low endocannabinoid tone with then the ingestion of CBD, which works indirectly, and we can increase our endocannabinoid tone up to the natural maximum limit. You will see that we can't push past that with CBD. This is because CBD works indirectly on the endocannabinoid receptors. It helps boost the availability of your human cannabinoids, and this makes it great at restoring your natural endocannabinoid tone. You cannot overstimulate your system to create an overly high endocannabinoid tone. However, the major drawback is that it may not be as effective as direct binding plant cannabinoids, which would be suited to an exceptionally low endocannabinoid tone. And that's where we come to the diagram on the right. You'll see here that your endocannabinoid tone is essentially flatlined out. You're very, very low. CBD is not going to quite touch the sides. And this is where you need THC to come in and bind directly to those receptors. And as you see there, you can go all the way around the tone uh, and, and overextend it. So THC works directly on the endocannabinoid receptors, making it great at restoring your natural endocannabinoid tone and for surpassing your natural tone limit. It's, for, it's fantastic for when a person's endocannabinoid tone is extremely low, such as in the case of a serious medical condition. However, continuous overstimulation can have negative consequences. And this leads me on to chronic THC users that actually overstimulate their endocannabinoid tone. So what happens? If you're taking THC continuously every day, what you're going to find is you're going to get a shutdown of the cannabinoid receptors due to overstimulation. And a lot of people refer to this as a tolerance. That literally means your receptors are shutting down. Not good. Um, the body will actually reduce the amount of human cannabinoid levels um, that it produces because what's happening is the body is being signaled to that it doesn't need to produce human cannabinoids when direct binding plant cannabinoids like THC are present and in abundance. And then the enzymes themselves, they're actually being overworked here because it takes them much longer to process a direct binding plant cannabinoid like THC compared to the human cannabinoids. So yeah, chronic THC use, uh, it, it is reversible. Exercise, diet, maybe a little bit of CBD might help you back, back into balance. So which cannabinoids you require, dosage and frequency will all be determined by the starting position of your endocannabinoid tone along with your medical condition. We know that cannabinoids interact with other receptors in the body, but it's starting to look likely that the severity of a medical condition is actually reflected by the state of a person's endocannabinoid tone. A low endocannabinoid tone is bad for the maintenance of your health. So too is an overstimulated high endocannabinoid tone, such as in the case of chronic THC use. Listening to your body becomes key to discovering which cannabinoids, dose and frequency will suit your personal endocannabinoid tone. 
So you're looking to supplement and you're looking for a CBD oil to help uh, bring your tone back into balance. What are the different types of CBD oils? Which one should you choose? So there's five different types of CBD oils that we see on the market at the moment. We have whole plant, we have full spectrum, broad spectrum, narrow spectrum, and a no spectrum CBD oil. So what is whole plant? <laughs> Simple definition, it's crude. It's a, it's a crude extract. Um, and whole plant CBD oil will use an unrefined CBD extract. It will contain key compounds from the cannabis flower, such as cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, plus the undesirable compounds, such as fats, lipids, waxes, and chlorophyll. These undesirable compounds are considered contaminants in CBD extracts. And the more undesirable compounds present in an extract, the lower the quality of the CBD oil. And this also holds true when making hash. Uh, a hash maker is looking to only extract the trichomes, and that's exactly what we want to do uh, with a CBD extract. We're looking to extract the, uh, the compounds in the trichomes. So a hash maker produces a very high grade hash that it should be just trichomes in there, but low grade hash will contain uh, waste plant material in there. And it, it's completely mirrored in CBD extraction as well. Whole plant, Crude CBD oil does fully benefit from the entourage effect. Um, however, it will contain controlled cannabinoids such as THC, CBN or THCV. Now, if the combined total amount of the controlled cannabinoids is over one milligram per container, the product is actually classed as a schedule one drug under the misuse of drugs regulation 2001. Then we have full spectrum CBD oil. This is, this is a very high quality oil. Uh, it is the most effective, but sadly it is more or less illegal over the counter. So full spectrum CBD oil uses a refined CBD extract. The key compounds of cannabinoids and terpenes will be present along with some flavonoids. So what's happened is the undesirable compounds of the fats, lipids, waxes, and chlorophyll, they've all been removed, resulting in a very high quality oil. So full spectrum oil fully benefits from the entourage effect. Um, however, by definition, this product will contain controlled cannabinoids such as THC, CBN or THCV. And if the combined total amount of controlled cannabinoids is over one milligram per container, same as in the uh, whole plant extract, the product then is classed as a schedule one drug. And that brings us on to broad spectrum CBD oil, which high quality, very effective and actually legal over the counter. So broad spectrum CBD oil uses a further refined CBD extract. The key compounds of cannabinoids and terpenes will be present along with a few trace amounts of flavonoids. So the undesirable compounds of fats, lipids, waxes and chlorophyll, they've been removed. The controlled cannabinoids such as THC, CBN and THCV, these have also been removed, classifying broad spectrum as a legal high quality CBD oil. Broad spectrum CBD oil does benefit from the entourage effect, although not quite as much as full spectrum due to the loss of direct receptor binding cannabinoids such as THC, CBN and THCV. So broad spectrum CBD oil does not contain controlled cannabinoids such as THC, CBN, THCV. It is not classified as a schedule one drug and may be sold as a food supplement. So the next step in the classification is narrow spectrum CBD oil. So what's happened here between the narrow spectrum and the, uh, the broad spectrum? So we see narrow spectrum CBD oil uses an over refined CBD extract. The number of cannabinoids, minor cannabinoids uh, and terpenes present has been significantly reduced through this over refinement process. The undesirable compounds of fats, lipids, waxes and chlorophyll have been removed along with controlled cannabinoids. So narrow spectrum CBD oil does not fully benefit from the entourage effect. The over refinement uh, results in a loss of these minor cannabinoids and terpenes, and this reduces the entourage effect. Narrow spectrum CBD oil doesn't contain controlled cannabinoids and can be sold as a food supplement. So we'd say it's good quality, medium effectiveness, because we've had that drop in uh, entourage effect, but it is legal. And that brings us on to a no spectrum CBD oil. Uh, made from isolate, it has limited effectiveness, but it is legal. So no spectrum CBD oil uses a CBD isolate extract. Uh, there is only CBD present. The isolated extract is usually 99% pure CBD. There are no additional cannabinoids and there are no terpenes or flavonoids. No spectrum CBD oil does not benefit from the entourage effect and the effectiveness is actually biphasic. So once hitting optimal dosage, we see that effects begin to reverse or diminish even when uh, dosages are increased. 
Um, no spectrum CBD oil contains just isolated CBD. It does not contain any controlled cannabinoids. It's not classified as a Schedule One drug. It can be sold as a food supplement. CBD isolate does have one massive advantage, though, is and that is that it's approved by the World Anti-Doping Agency for the use in professional athletes. Now, uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency does not approve the use of any other cannabinoids in competition, whether they are controlled or not. And as we were talking about before about the entourage effect and the biphasic effect, effect of CBD isolate, you can see here in the diagram that as dosage increases, the benefits are linear for full and broad spectrum. Increased dosage continues to be effective. Whereas we see CBD isolate, once hitting optimal dosage, effects actually begin to reverse diminish or even when a reversal diminish, even when dosages are increased. So let's summarize those, oil, the, those different types of oils again. So uh, whole plant is probably going to fall under a cannabis-based uh, product for medicinal use in humans because of the THC levels. If it was a CBD oil, uh, it's going to be low quality because, again, it's got all the contaminants in there that we, we don't really want in there. Um, it is illegal over the counter because of the controlled cannabinoids. Full spectrum is uh, in the same position. However, full spectrum is, it's high quality and it is the most effective because it does contain those direct binding uh, cannabinoids. Sadly though, it is illegal. That brings us to broad spectrum, high quality, very effective and legal. That's probably your best bet if you're looking for a very high quality CBD supplement. Narrow spectrum, again, good, good quality, medium effective, effectiveness and it's legal. And then we have our no spectrum again. It's just an isolate and it has limited effectiveness. So we mentioned about the control cannabinoids. Let's dive into that. So any cannabinoid that is a cannabinol derivative is currently illegal in the UK. At present, there are 12 cannabinoids classified as controlled substances. Controlled cannabinoids can be prescribed by a medical, by a doctor for medical use though. So we see the controlled cannabinoids on the left there. These can be uh, grouped into Delta 9 THC, Delta 9 THCV, Delta 8 THC, CBN, CBNM, C5, or simplified as THC, CBN and THCV. Interestingly enough, Delta 10 THC is not listed, but we can assume that it's still classified as controlled because it is a cannabinol derivative. Quick fun fact for you here that THCA in its isolated form is not actually controlled, believe it or not. However, it is understood that THCA readily degrades both naturally and with a catalyst or environmental change for example, ingestion into THC, which is a Schedule One controlled cannabinoid. So with this in mind, we have to assume that once a THC degrades into a, uh, a controlled substance, that would thus make that product uh, controlled. So what does the Home Office have to say about these controlled cannabinoids? Well, <laughs> Two statements from them. The first one, if a CBD product contained any control cannabinoids unintentionally or otherwise THC or THCD then it is highly likely that that product would be controlled however they also then set out an exemption and there's three parts to this that you must adhere to for your CBD product to essentially be exempt um, the preparation or other product is not designed for administration of the controlled drug to a human being or animal the controlled drug in any component part is packaged in such a form or in combination with other active or inert substances in such a manner that it cannot be recovered by readily applicable means or in a yield which constitutes a risk to human health. And no one component part of the product or preparation contains more than one milligram of the control drug. And that brings us on to, is it 12 milligrams we're allowed in there? Are we allowed 12 different cannabinoids that are controlled at one milligram each? Possibly not. We need to assume a worst, worst case scenario approach here and assume that the one milligram threshold covers all these psychoactive cannabinoids and the sum of them together. Uh, this was written by the uh, government chemist guidance. Um, I, I think it's wise for people to adhere to this. Um, especially with the Home Office's previous statement that if it contains any, it could potentially be controlled. 
so that finishes up on the controlled cannabinoids. I'm going to hand you over to Charles, who's going to discuss the certificate of analysis. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, okay, certificate of analysis, um, COAs, um, they are a really efficient and transparent way on reviewing a CBD oil. Um, each batch of a CBD oil should have a four panel certificate of analysis accompanied with it. This, is, this ensures safe and accurate consumption uh, for all. A COA document is proof that the batch has been tested by an approved, ideally independent third party laboratory and contains the stated amount of CBD on the label, as well as being free from contaminant. THC is in line with legal limits and free from heavy metals, pesticides, residual solvents, mycotoxins and microbials. So if we have a look at what a full panel COA looks like, so to begin with it's the cannabinoid potency. Um, accurate determination of cannabinoid concentrations in CBD supplements is one of the most important components of testing. A potency test will display the levels of cannabinoids present within the product. So does the CBD content match what's stated on the label? Are there any additional minor cannabinoids, which obviously are beneficial as these contribute to the entourage effect? Are there any control cannabinoids present? For example, a 10 mil bottle of CBD oil should not contain more than one milligram total of control cannabinoids. Now this is expressed as no more than a combined percentage of 0.01%. Now limit of quantification or LOQ is important to ensure that the lowest concentration of a cannabinoid can be determined. So if looking at a COA, a certificate of analysis uh, has an LOQ of 0.05%, control cannabinoids could be displayed as non-detect when in fact they are present because the LOQ doesn't go down to 0.01%. So the next test, just well, just looking as an example of three COAs. So these are um, three certificate of analysis from products that are available on the market. So we have Bud and Tender, which is a 10% 10 mil. And you'll see clearly on this certificate of analysis in the two green circles where it says THC, total THC non-detect and total uh, CBN non-detect. And this certificate of analysis tests down to 0.001. Now, brand X and brand Y, which are products that are available on the marketplace at this moment in time, um, report 8.7 for brand X, 8.7 milligrams of CBN. So making it a, an illegal product or it's got controlled cannabinoids in. And brand Y actually has 2.7 milligrams of CBN, 5.3 milligram, milligrams of THC and 0.5 milligram of THCV. So a total of 8.5 of controlled cannabinoids. So that's why a certificate of analysis is very good at looking at the uh, cannabinoids that are contained within the product. The next test of a full panel certificate of analysis is terpenes. So terpenoids are produced in the trichomes of the cannabis flower along with the cannabinoids like CBDA. So terpenes give cannabis its individual profile of flavour and aroma. So identifying natural cannabis terpenes present in a CBD supplement will determine which type of spectrum the CBD supplement is and what it might have. This is a quote from Dr. Ethan Russo, who's well respected in the cannabis sphere. Terpenoids, after the effects of the cannabinoids, in a way that is often synergistic. Synergy is a boosting off effect. So it would be the idea that two plus two, instead of equaling four, it gives you an eight in terms of the benefit. The next test is flavonoids. Flavonoids are photonutrients. They're found in the leaves, the flowers, and the trichomes of the cannabis plant. They play a role in the plant pigments, flower coloration, taste, smell, and overall sensory experience. Along with cannabinoids and terpenoids, flavonoids can also bind to the cannabinoid receptors, and thus they too contribute to the entourage effect, the synergy boosting. Although not crucial to a CBD supplement, like a sublingual oil, they do help determine the type of extract used in a CBD supplement. The next test is heavy metals. Hemp loves to collect heavy metals. It absorbs heavy metals from the soil, water and earth. These toxic elements can be passed from the plant into the CBD extract and then into a consumer's body where they would pose a health risk. It's important for CBD supplements to be free from heavy metals. And the interesting fact here is that organic certification does not require any screening for heavy metals. Pesticides. Pesticides.
species are used in many forms of commercial farming all across the world. They are carcinogenic and mutagenic, causing serious harm to consumers, the most vulnerable being those that are already immune and compromised. Testing CBD supplements for pesticides ensures the product is clean and free from residual pesticides. The next test is microbials. According to the United Nations, one in 10 people worldwide get ill from consuming a microbiologically contaminated food. Now, microbiologically contamination can lead to serious illnesses and health issues. Common pathogenic screening tests for the presence of E. coli, salmonella and listeria. CBD supplements should be free from microbials. Next test of a full panel COA is residual solvents. So residual solvents can be chemicals left over from the process used to extract cannabinoids, terpenoids and flavonoids from the cannabis plant. Solvents can also be used in the filtration process too. Cannabis supplements should be free from any residual solvents or below the legal parts per million uh, required amount to determine as safe. Next test of the COA is mycotoxins. So mycotoxins are contaminants that naturally occur in molds and fungi which decompose organic matter. You can find molds that contain mycotoxins in a variety of crops such as nuts, spices, apples and coffee, coffee beans. You can also find mycotoxins in cannabis flour and then its subsequent extract, whether that be it in oils, edibles, tinctures or creams. Mycotoxins contain carcinogenic and mutagenic properties that can cause the development of cancerous cells and damage to the structure of your DNA and as such can be very harmful to humans, especially in cases of long-term exposure. CBD supplements should be free from mycotoxins. So to summarise on a COA, this is an example of the bottom tender summary sheet of uh, our full certificate analysis and you can see a panel at the top that clearly states what's passed and what's been tested um, with uh, all, all of the nine tests uh, displayed clearly for the consumer to see uh, before they buy the product. So I'll just hand over to Mark to wrap up on conclusions. Thanks Charles. Um, so we have discussed the endocannabinoid tone and this determines which cannabinoids to supplement with, the quantity and the frequency in order for you to achieve biological homeostasis and subsequently maintain your health. We have also discussed the types of CBD oil and uh, we can see that legality and effectiveness will vary right across the market. Um, controlled cannabinoids, they're fantastic in cannabis-based products for medicinal use. Sadly, they're not currently legal in over-the-counter CBD oils. And Charles finished up on the certificate of analysis. Does it, the oil that you're going to choose, does it contain the correct amount of CBD? What is the limit of quantification? Does it contain any controlled cannabinoids? Is it clean and is it safe to consume? And that brings us to the end of that. Uh, Mike? Do we have any questions? Sorry, let me just unmute myself, put me back on the screen. Do you want to take that off the screen, uh, Mark and Charles? Yep. Great. Good. Well, thank you so much for that. Really, really clear, really nice slides. And that, actually, the first question is can, uh, from Ross. Can I request a copy of the slides? Very impressed by the content of the presentation. So uh, are you going to make those available? We can do that through the society if you're happy for us to release them to others. Up to you. We, we can do that, yeah. We can do that. That's great. So that's that one answered, Ross. Thank you. It was actually, can you put questions in the Q&A, not the chat box, but just to get rid of one question in the chat, uh, which was, yes, I, I, sorry, it's gone off my screen, but can you, how do you measure the endocannabinoid tone? That's a very good question. So I'm going to pass it over to you guys. Very, <laughs> very good question. Um, so you can, you can draw blood um, and you can test your endocannabinoid levels there with a blood sample. However, <laughs> the problem is that, that your endocannabinoid levels will actually naturally fluctuate throughout the day. If you have a, a, a good meal, we're gonna see an increase in endocannabinoids there um, because the endocannabinoid system deals with energy intake and metabolism. So you will have a spike in endocannabinoids. Um, after exercise as well, you can see a spike in endocannabinoids. So to accurately determine the complete tone in terms of the receptors and at the activity of the enzymes is going to be quite hard at the moment. Um, all we can really do is look at uh, endocannabinoid levels as some form of marker for endocannabinoid tone. Thanks, Mark. Um, a question from Dominic Marco. What is the standardized volume of CBD oil batch volume wise in the UK? 
it was a standardized volume, but I'll, I'll let you know, I'm, it comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, classically, sort of 10 mils, 20 mils, sometimes 100 mils. 30, yeah. So there's, there's no standardization in any sense, is there? I, I would say that most companies sell uh, their CBD oil in 10, 10 mil bottles. This yeah. seems to be the most common. And the other, uh, related to that, of course, the, the ridiculous law of one milligram per container, <laughs> just to state what you've said. But, yeah. you know, um, if, if exactly the same oil, uh, can obviously be less than one milligram in a in a ten mil container. It may be just on the market a twenty mil container, but it may be over the limit on a hundred mil container. Exactly the same oil, which yeah, makes well, that particular um, regulation uh, totally balmy, I might say. Yeah. Uh, but so you've got, a, and also the other thing, perhaps you could explain is some companies uh, present the uh, concentration in milligrams per mil which is a, as a, from my medical point of view, I like that because it's easy to work it out, uh, particularly when we're prescribing an oil. I'm actually talking about that today. Um, others put in the percentage, you know, 0 0.5, yes, this is 5% oil. Can you just, for those who might not know, can you tell people how you work out how many milligrams there are in the bottle from, a, from the percentage? Okay, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we, yeah. on our product, we actually list the milligrams and then how many milligrams you consume with a 0.25 mil serving, which we say is a standard serving. So you can uh, differentiate between the different strengths of oil based on how many milligrams are present. So 500 milligrams in a 10 mil, that, that, that's 5%. 1,000 milligrams, 10%, 2,000 milligrams, 20%, and, and so on. Um, the tricky bit comes in where if you have 500 milligrams in a 10 mil, 5%, but then you've got 1,500 milligrams in a 30 mil, a consumer may not be able to relate to those as, as they're uh, realizing they are the same product. Hence, yeah. where the percentages come into play, and that makes it easier for the, for the consumer to um, understand that that 10 mil bottle and that 30 mil bottle next to each other are actually the same strength. Yeah, it is a bit confusing for, for the People who aren't into it, they pop yeah. into Boots or Holland and Barrett or online, and it is a bit confusing, I have to say, but uh, thank you for explaining it. Um, next question is, thank you for the presentation. Do you have clinical data publications for the endocannabinoid tone managed by phytocannabinoid? Is there publications around that? Yes, there are. Yeah, there um, are indeed. Not, not personally published by us, but <laughs> they are out there. No, there's, there's a big literature now in the neuroscience literature. If people are really interested, um, some people will know this on the call, others not. If you, if you look at PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, uh, that's an open as access to all medical and related sciences journals, and you type in endocannabinoid or type in THC or type in whatever you like, uh, then you'll, within a less than a second, you'll come up with probably several thousand publications and you've got to wade through them all. But it is a definitive way of getting the clinical scientific literature on any of these topics, yep. in case people didn't know. Um, next question for you guys. What is the average price of a lab service to provide a COA? Okay, so, well, we've been through a lot and a lot of labs. We've been to visit labs. Um, prices vary massively. <coughs> For example, one lab could charge you £300 just for a potency test. Uh, other labs could charge you about five, £600 for a full panel test. Um, we actually went with ACS in America because they are a, they're a pure cannabis testing laboratory. So day in, day out, they're testing THC as well as CBD. So they really specialize in cannabis and they know what they're doing. Um, it is a bit of a faff shipping our products over to America to get tested. Um, but, but it's worthwhile because they're a yeah, really good lab. Um, yeah. There has been issues with lab testing previously, uh, especially in America, um, on the in the THC game, uh, a lot of labs were artificially increasing THC numbers. So uh, you know, obviously, your higher THC flower in, in your dispensary, the, the more appealable it is uh, to the masses. And we were also heard rumors in Europe that some labs were not testing for THC or CBN and then claiming non-detect on the COA. Yes. Underhand. Yeah, I'm, I'm so pleased you do test for terpenes because there's, there's many people, many companies, both in the medicinal prescribed market and the over-the-counter CBD market who just don't test for terpenes. And I, I think the consumer personally has a right to know what's in the product that they're going to swallow or put under their tongue Absolutely. or, or inhale. And, you know, 
as I said several times, if you buy a packet of crisps, you know what's in it. You should know what's in the, your own medicine. So it's really important to test for the full minor cannabinoid profile and the terpenes, personally. So just on the terpenes there, Mike. So, uh, for example, beta caryophylline commonly found in black pepper, that actually binds to your CD2 yeah. receptor, making it, by definition, a cannabinoid. So, yeah, terpenes are... Uh, terpenes. Yes. Great, they're great. Is it a controlled cannabinoid, though, beta caryophylline? No. <laughs> no, it's a very grey area. Anyway, um, and two questions from Andrew, Andrew Bradford. Hi. Uh, any differences between indica and sativa? And taste is often a barrier to taking CBD. Any thoughts on the taste? Because I do admit that CBD so, tastes foul. The, uh, <laughs> not all CBD oil will taste foul. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> we've got a product that might help you there. Okay, that's good. <laughs> When it comes to uh, sativa and indica, they're no longer classifications that really hold true. Um, they don't hold true biologically to the plant. And um, what we're seeing in the market in general, especially the THC side, is that everything's more or less a hybrid now. Um, it's, it's more the terpene profiles that are dictating the effects. Yeah. Um, and hence, you mentioned earlier, testing for terpenes, uh, that will sort of determine the effect over whether there's this indica sativa. That's actually starting to get dropped now in, in terms of yeah, classification as we're, we're moving forward. Yeah, I'm pleased about that. I mean, in fairness, two or three, four years ago when I was teaching, I used to uh, promulgate what I think now is a bit of a myth that indica tends to be sedating, sativa tends to be uplifting or alerting. I, don't, I think we can say it's not true. You'd have to look at the chemovar, uh, see what's in it, and you can get, you know, sedating sativas and uplifting indicas. So it, it, I, it, I would forget it. It's also important to mention that yeah. the actual plant will adapt to its environment. So, exactly. yeah, you yeah. know, if you take an OG Kush and grow it in multiple different locations in different yeah. environments, it's going to produce different, slightly different cannabinoid profile and a different terpenoid profile. Yeah. So which is the original OG Kush? We we, we just don't know. Exactly. No, I think we should now forget those terminologies. Um, you know, Singh, thanks both. Great presentation. Are there any particular carrier oils which improve bioavailability? Good question. So we initially are using MCT because it's got a shorter fatty chain on the assumption that it would improve bioavailability. Um, we have had people say or come across people that cannot consume MCT, whether they're allergic to coconuts or they get an upset stomach. Um, I think it's going to come down to a personal preference for most people in terms of bioavailability of the actual oils. They're, they're, they're all going to be pretty similar. You, as long as you're holding it under your tongue for your oral, oral mucosa to absorb for a minimum of three minutes. We sort of recommend, ideally, if you can try and hold it up until nine minutes. We don't particularly want to swallow the oil. Our first pass of metabolism of the liver will take out some of that CBD and it also convert it into six and seven hydroxy CBD, which in and themselves aren't bad compounds and they do have therapeutic effects, but you're just decreasing the amount of actual mm. CBD uh, available. Yeah, and another thing I think people all should say is what the carry oil is, because, you know, I've seen some daft things that carry oil is peanut oil, and if you're allergic to peanuts, that's not frightfully good for you. No so, uh, you know, the, uh, it, it's very unusual to be allergic to cannabis oils generally, but if people are, then it's, it's nearly always, not necessarily always, but nearly always the carry oil that they're allergic Correct. to. Correct, yes. And a lot of people don't say what carry oil it is. Uh, they should. should. They should. They should do, yep. They should. Uh, Sean, Philip, you mentioned blood tests for ECS tone. Where are these available in the UK? Um, that's something, I, uh, Sean, I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. It's, uh, it's not something I've delved into too heavily where I can get it done. As I mentioned before, in terms of doing a blood test, how you, you're not going to get an accurate, unless you're doing a blood test every hour to monitor your natural endocannabinoid fluctuation, <laughs> which to a certain degree mirrors your tone. Um, it, it, it is a worthwhile exercise to a certain degree, but until we can really look at how active your receptors are, for example, uh, with the THC, we know the receptors actually start to shut down. So until we can actually look at the receptors, understand how active they are and the activity of the enzymes, we can't quite build a full picture of, uh, of someone's endocannabinoid tone, but you yourself will know if you're feeling good. And if you're, you know, if you're slightly feeling off, that's more than likely that's going to be down to your endocannabinoid tone. Yep. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Are there any advantages and disadvantages to adding CBD to a high THC product 
rather than using a combined THC CBD product. Uh, so, 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 sorry, can you just rephrase that? Uh, is he asking if we... If I think this is for prescription um, purposes. Yep. Uh, is there an advantage or disadvantage to add a CBD oil to a high THC oil separately rather than use a balanced a combined product? So, so what, te te consuming them separately? Yeah, uh, I think... I think there is personally because then you can yeah. titrate you can titrate one and the other up and down. If you've got a balanced fixed ratio, you're stuck with that ratio. Exactly. I do accept that it, it, it adds to the cost because you've got to get two separate prescriptions for two different oils, which can be a significant factor. Uh, yeah. But I, I personally, if cost is not an issue, uh, then I would personally like to use a CBD to titrate and a THC to titrate both up and down separately. That's a bit of a, um, that's just my view. Well, that's yeah, I think. No, we, we, yeah, we agree with you there, Mike. Oh, good. All right. Um, uh, the question, total content of cannabinoid in bottle helps the consumer to compare prices. Yes. That's true. And there's quite a big variation in prices, isn't there? And the, sometimes for good reason, because you know, they've, they've added in other perhaps turmeric or something to it that makes it a, a slightly different sort of product which adds to the cost. But uh, there's a big variation, isn't there? For the, if you look at the cost per cost per milligram as it were yep. it's a big variation so it's so useful the, mm. the big thing there is to look at the the minor cannabinoids what minor cannabinoids are present are the native terpenes present that you're going to start to that will start to determine which type of cbd extract has been used in the oil um so you, you've got your no spectrum your narrow spectrum your broad spectrum yes we see companies advertising full spectrum and if a company is hitting the dead on one milligram rule, uh, could be potentially playing a dangerous game because different labs are going to show different results. Even the same lab with just another lab technician on that day can actually produce different um, results. Yeah. So a couple of questions have crept into the chat. So I'll just divert slightly just for one moment. The yeah. oils available through Project 21 are full spectrum. Is that correct? Yes, is the answer. Uh, because Project 2021, which for those who don't know, is a, a stand back observational trial run by Drug Science. Now we've got about 1,700 patients on it. It's a great project. Uh, and the advantage for the consumer is that the cost is capped at, broadly speaking, £150 a month. So I digress, but it's worth mentioning this as a question on it. And yes, those are full spectrum products. They are CBPMs, they are prescribable, and therefore they have, um, in varying proportions, of course, uh, THC in the vast majority. I think there's one or two um, CBD only compounds in there. We do have medical value, but generally speaking, they are full spectrum products. Yes. The other one quickly in the chat. I heard recently that people with IgE mast cell activation disorders can actually be allergic to hemp and cannabis products. Oh, that's okay. Good. That's a good I, question. I, I, that very must good be question. something you've heard about recently. I haven't heard that recently. I mean, you can be allergic to hemp and cannabis products. Yes, it's in my experience, it's very rare. Yeah. And I said I said just now, if, if it is epidiolex, for example, people can be allergic to strawberries, which is a, a flavoring in epidiolex was one example. So it's often the not the contaminants, the wrong word, the flavoring or the carrier oil you're allergic to. So I don't know about IG mass on activation personally, I'm afraid. So I'm gonna have to pass on that one. Um, we've got, what's the time? Five to seven. We've got three more questions here. I think we've got time just to do those and we'll probably have to call it a day. Uh, Andrew, are there any other potential delivery methods other than the simple dropper? Yes. You, so it, you can basically look at it in three categories. You can use a vaporizer, which is very fast acting, but it, it doesn't last for as long. Uh, if you do a, a dropper, it's sort of, we will call that sort of um, medium speed acting and it will last for a medium length. And then you can take, uh, you can ingest, for example, a soft gel. That's going to be very slow acting, but it will last for a, a longer time. And also you get uh, metabolism by the liver, changing into slightly different compounds. Uh, so, yeah, there's the, 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 the quick, the medium and essentially the, the long all, all have pros and, and cons to them. Yeah, and I think over the next few months, and if you agree, we're going to see next year or so, we're going to see quite a, a, a variety of different delivery methods coming onto the, the market. And, yeah, uh, so particularly if the states def, um, federalize, makes it federally legal, we'll see an inrush of all the various products that we've got at the moment in Oregon and Washington and California, homely, but we're not there yet. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, just going to say there, Mike, we are actually yeah. working on a, a, a new product that will be slightly different into the market. Um, okay. I won't reveal what it is Good. just yet, but it, but it will all be... Right. Something slightly different. Okay, watch this space for that one. Uh, yeah. Two more. 
do you use do you use the cloning method to always ensure the same level standard? Uh, I, don't, I can't that, answer that. That's more know. for uh, that's for your medical cannabis. Um, the hemp that we use is is, is grown outside. Um, so, it, you know, in, you, you can't guarantee a uniform crop outside at all. You'd have to grow inside in a very, very controlled environment. And at the moment, that's only occurring with uh, medical cannabis. Thank you. Last question, I think, from Michael Bit T21 again. So for the most effect, should you, have a, should you have a medical condition that fulfills the prerequisite and the seven conditions that are eligible for Project 2021, should you go for Project 2021 products? I suppose the answer is yes, and I can speak to that because... Uh, We've just released the new formulary for T21. It's, a, it's not the full formulary you can get. It has 100 plus medical products available from 16 or so producers. The T21 list is slightly more restrictive, but not in any real sense, because there's still 30 plus products on T21 list. So it's a good choice of product. And the advantage, as I say, advantage for society is you're going to contribute to really good quality um, scientific validation project that we have thousands of patients which we can analyze and say, this product's good for that, that's good for that, et cetera, et cetera. And also for you personal point of view, you get the, pro the um, product cheaper. Um, and that was the last question. Any more questions? Uh, Rachel Warner said, you didn't answer my question because I suggest I go to PubMed. Yeah, it was just a bit complicated to answer. Uh, I can't give you the, the, um, you know, the actual publications off the top of my head, Rachel. So it may be a slightly lazy answer, but it is now one minute to seven. So I'm going to continue to be lazy and say, go to PubMed. But you probably won't thank me for that. But Rachel, thank you for your question. Um, and guys, it's uh, one minute to seven. So I'm going to stop at this point. And can I thank Charles and Mark for a great, great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, Mark. Thank uh, you to the audience. Yeah, thank, thank you. Audience. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to Gillian, who's behind the scenes, uh, making sure we behave ourselves and everything works smoothly. And it has, Gillian. So thank you very much. OK, everybody, seven o'clock. Have a good evening and we'll see you at the next webinar before long.